So we've had some questions about, you know, about what fault was this earthquake on? And you have to remember this is about 23 kilometers beneath the surface. So any kind of guess at what fault it's on is really pure speculation at this point. But when we look at the focal mechanism of the earthquake, that's how did the fault actually rupture? It pulled apart, it was in tension. So it was a, a, a tensional uh, stress that caused this earthquake. And it occurred right near this kind of cluster of kind of these messy, these messy little faults that are kind of running almost north-south uh, here near the town of Duval. Now we had an earthquake in 1996 right here, a 5-4 in Duval that caused millions of dollars of damage to some substations. There were some damage to homes that was widely felt, uh, and, but it was shallower than this earthquake. This earthquake was a bit deeper. It was a little further north. And again, it was a magnitude 4-6 instead of a 5-4. So it was an order of magnitude smaller which is good news for us because uh, we, we felt it, we got woken up, we got alerted, but we didn't get uh, damage. Now, Seattle, the earthquake early warning system worked very well, but because the earthquake is deep, by the time those P waves arrived at the surface, it covered a pretty big area. So there was about four, three or four seconds warning for Seattle that strong motion could be on the way, at least shaking was on the way. But t Tacoma, of course, would, would have gotten significantly more. Um, and we can answer questions. Oh, I did want to mention that the biggest fault in the region nearby is the South Whidbey Island fault structure that kind of runs in, in this direction. And this does not appear to be associated with that. And I'm basing that on the mechanism how the fault actually broke. This has kind of a strike slip with some um, reverse thrust faulting along it, and so it, it behaves differently than the earthquake that we had out here. I know, uh, I know a lot of people have some questions. Over in California this morning, there was also an earthquake. Can, yeah. Can you break down that, you know, sure. may not be connected to that? Or sure. So in Southern California, we have a couple of earthquakes. We have earthquake sequence that's ongoing and uh, producing, it's shallower and it's very vigorous aftershock sequence. We're getting big aftershocks from that region. But that's due to strain that's from the Pacific plate kind of shearing California. And there's also other things going on in the North America crust that makes a very complicated situation in Southern California. But those earthquakes and that tectonic setting is very different from us up here. So we're not, Northern California is not being affected by those earthquakes and certainly not the Cascadia region where we're in a different tectonic setting. So when you see those clusters of earthquakes, even though it's on that ring of fire, it doesn't have... Yeah, go, uh, go ahead. Even though it's on that ring of fire, there is no connection between the, the earthquakes having all across the West Coast? Yeah, no, there really isn't. Uh, you know, we get, we, we have seen correlations between, with big earthquakes can, pr can trigger or, or stimulate other earthquake activity um, nearby. So in the Big Bear Landers earthquake sequence in Southern California, kind of the California Nevada border region kind of lit up with little earthquakes for a while and they, they died off. So there was a clear kind of transference of some of that strain that kind of triggered some of that faulting locally within California or California Nevada border region. And that was out even further east in the Mojave Desert than the, the current earthquakes. So uh, but that, again, wouldn't affect the Cascadia region. Well, you know, it's after the earthquake happens. Okay. So the earthquake happens, the, the, the ground motion moves out, the P wave is fastest. So our sensors, as soon as the P wave hit the surface, it triggered our system. And a couple of seconds later, we were able to come up with an estimate of magnitude and location. But because of the way that it spread out over a wide region, uh, Seattle only got a few seconds warning, three or four seconds, uh, it would have been more if it was shallower, actually. First of all, when it, with a deep earthquake, you're farther from the rupture. So if you're right above the earthquake, you don't shake as violently as, as if that earthquake was very shallow, right? So it, it, it doesn't hit you as hard right in the epicentral region of the earthquake. But because it's down here and the rock is pretty competent down here, there's not a lot of cracks and breaks in it, it allows the energy to 
to come up without a lot of dissipation until it gets near the surface. So it reaches a wider area. And that's why we're seeing Vancouver, BC, down to Olympia, out to Yakima and Wenatchee, uh, all reporting this earthquake, even though it's a, a magnitude 4.6, which is a moderate size event. So the main difference is the Nisqually uh, earthquake was in that Juan de Fuca plate, the ocean slab that is being forced to subduct beneath Washington. It's sliding down beneath our feet. And under us here, it's between 60 and 70 kilometers depth. And so that earthquake occurred way down 30 something miles beneath the surface. This earthquake is in the North America crust, but it's not right at the surface. It's down 23 kilometers. So it's maybe one third of the distance down as the Nisqually earthquake. So it's, it's much shallower than the Nisqually event. And it's a different source zone in a sense because it's a different s slab of rock that it's occurring. So this is occurring in the North America plate. The Nisqually actually cr occurred in the Juan de Fuca plate under North America. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't feel another aftershock, but it's very possible we will. Uh, the reason being is down at this depth, we have less vigorous aftershocks typically, and they tend to die off sooner than if they're right up near the surface. Now that said, this could also trigger a larger earthquake. If there's enough strain built in the region and conditions are just right, one of these little aftershocks could take off and become its own big earthquake, and then we would be looking at this as a foreshock. Now there's a very, that's a very small probability, but it's certainly real. So there's a, for the next 24 hours or so, there's a greater chance of a, of a larger earthquake occurring than background.